Hello and welcome to this mini gem brought to you by the Association for Elderly Medicine Education. This mini gem aims to provide a short how-to guide to conducting a systematic review. My name is Emily Ball and I have been working on a Cochrane review with Dr Jonathan Hewitt and other colleagues as part of the Cochrane Fellowship Scheme. Cochrane Fellowships, funded by NHS Research Scotland and a Stroke Research Development Grant from Health and Care Research Wales, have enabled four early career researchers in Scotland and Wales to work on systematic reviews within the Cochrane Dementia and Cognitive Improvement Group and within the Cochrane Stroke Group. This presentation aims to provide an overview of what a systematic review is, why systematic reviews are useful within the field of geriatric medicine and key steps to follow when conducting a systematic review. So what is a systematic review? It's a systematic search of the literature with the aim to identify all studies relating to a particular research question. The process of searching the literature and deciding which studies are included in a systematic review should be clearly reported so it could be repeated in the future. A systematic review summarises the evidence from individual research studies. For example, as part of the Cochrane Fellowship, we have been updating a systematic review looking at how effective aromatherapy is at reducing behavioural and psychological symptoms associated with dementia. Systematic reviews that are performed to a high standard should carefully identify and summarise all studies relating to a particular research question, with the aim to provide reliable evidence that could be used by healthcare practitioners to inform clinical practice and improve the care of older people. So step one to conducting a systematic review is to scope the literature. What is your research question? Has a systematic review answering your research question already been conducted? If so, how long ago was it conducted? If it was performed a while ago, could a search of the literature be conducted now and findings from any research studies be included? Hence the need for clearly reporting methodology in the systematic review. Step 2. Create a protocol. Before starting a systematic review, create a protocol that outlines your research question, the types of studies you want to include or exclude from your review, what outcomes you plan to look at, and what data you are aiming to extract. It is also useful to document your search strategy in the protocol, such as which databases and search terms you will be using in order to identify studies for your systematic review. The protocol then becomes a helpful tool for you to refer back to during the systematic review process. It is good practice to register your systematic review protocol with databases such as Prospero. Prospero is a database of prospective health-related systematic reviews. As the reviews are prospectively reported, it helps to reduce publication bias by comparing the finalised review to the initial protocol. By looking at the Prospero website, you are able to check whether your research question has already been answered and also check whether others are planning to produce a similar systematic review. Step 3. Assessing the studies. Once you have conducted your search of the literature, you want to assess which studies meet your inclusion criteria. On the right of the screen, I have shown an example of a PRISMA diagram that shows the total number of studies that were returned when searching the literature, down to the number of studies that were included in the systematic review. If you have searched multiple bibliographic databases, the same study may have been returned more than once, so it's important to deduplicate them. I have found software such as EndNote and Covidence helpful when starting to deduplicate studies. Next, you want to assess whether these studies meet your inclusion and exclusion criteria. If many studies are returned, you can begin by screening just the title and abstracts of each study. 
Once you have narrowed down your list of studies that appear to be relevant, you can start to read through the full text of these papers to see if they still meet your inclusion and exclusion criteria. It's good practice for two people to screen the research studies for a systematic review and any conflicts to be resolved by a third reviewer. Step four is to extract the data from the studies and assess the risk of bias. It is helpful to create a data extraction form that outlines the data that you want to extract from each study, such as the number of participants, the location of the study, and findings from the study. It is also important to assess the quality of each of the studies and the impact this may have on their findings. For example, did the researchers know which treatment dementia patients have received when assessing the patient's cognitive function? Again, it is good practice for two reviewers to independently extract the data in order to aid accuracy. Lastly, step five, you need to synthesize the data that you have extracted from the studies and write up the review. It is good to address whether individual studies use similar methods and also to assess the quality of the included studies and discuss their limitations. Also, perhaps think about how clinically applicable the findings of the studies are within the field of geriatric medicine. For example, are the population in these research studies similar to the clinical patients you are treating in hospital? You may want to purely focus your systematic review on narratively summarising the studies. However, although it's not required for a systematic review, if the data allow, you may want to conduct a meta-analysis. In summary, a systematic review should involve an exhaustive search of the literature that aims to summarise the evidence of the research studies. Summarise findings reported in systematic reviews may help to guide clinical practice. And lastly, there are lots of helpful tools and resources available when conducting a systematic review. It may also be helpful to work with others who are experienced in conducting reviews, including librarians and statisticians. Thank you for watching this mini gem presentation. Shown on the screen are some resources that I have mentioned in the presentation that you may find useful when conducting a systematic review.